Welcome to the fourth annual Guild of Music Supervisors Conference. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Very excited to be here tonight and to celebrate the five nominees in the Outstanding Music Supervision category at the Primetime Emmys this year. Uh, before I uh, introduce the uh, nominees to you, I would like to thank the Los Angeles Film School for hosting us tonight at this wonderful theater. Thank you so much. And our sponsor, First Com Music. Thank you very much. The first nominee I would like to introduce to you is Robin Erdenk, uh, nominated for the marvelous Mrs. Mas Maisel. Robin won a primetime Emmy last year for the same project. This is her second nomination, and she also received a Grammy nomination for Call Me By Your Name and won a Guild of Music Supervisor Award. <laughs> Give it up for Robin. Thomas Golubich, everyone met Thomas. He is nominated for Better Cold Saul, second primetime Emmy nomination. He was nominated at the inaugural uh, award uh, in 2017, also for Better Call Saul, nominated for Grammy Six Feet Under and a Guild of Music Supervisor award winner. Jasper Leake is nominated for the documentary Quincy. <laughs> From Australia, lives in Los Angeles, and this is Chasper's first work as a music supervisor, which already got him a Grammy nomination. <laughs> and Brienne Rose, nominated for Russian Doll. This is her first Emmy nomination, and I'm sure it's not the last one. And then I all need you to turn around. There is a camera behind there. And say hello to Steven Gisitsky, who is in New York. Won a Grammy in 2018 for La La Land, Guild of Music Super Award winner, and nominated for Fossi Verdon. Hey. hey! Can you hear us? I can, yes. Well, what importance does this award have for you personally, but also for the community and for music supervisors? How important is it to have uh, the Television Academy uh, give out this award to a music supervisor? Thomas, if you want to start. Sure. Um, I mean, we started the Guild in 2010 um, as a way of being able to uh, remedy the problem that we had, which was that our field was not fully understood, um, that we had a lot of misconceptions about what responsibilities music supervisors had, uh, that there was a, 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 almost a dismissive attitude about the creative impact the music supervisors have on projects. And as we were working harder and harder and having more and more of an impact on different forms of media, we found that there was really a, a, a lack of understanding about what we do and a lack of respect for what we do. It was affecting how we were paid. It was affecting how we were treated in our jobs. Um, and we felt that we should put a group together to try to find a way to work towards uh, a sort of a brighter future for our profession. And so a number of us kind of, uh, and Maureen Crow, who's in the audience tonight, was the one that's, that started this. Yay. You know, yeah, she was the she was sort of the, the 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 rocket ship that kind of you know dragged the rest of us in the tail. Um, but basically, I think having the Emmy is in many ways uh, a vital thing. Like you know, most of the professions in film and television have unions attached to them, which means that they have support, they have uh, a structure, they have a community. We did not have that, and so by putting this guild together and by advocating for the Emmy, it was an opportunity for us for the first time to see that people were noticing what we were doing. They were interested in what we were doing. They were recognizing our contribution, both creatively and professionally. So I think that this Emmy is in many ways uh, a key way for the world to recognize what we do and how we bring exciting ideas to table and also how well we work together. I mean, we're a very warm and collaborative group and I feel really excited when anybody has the opportunity to get nominated. And, you know, for me personally, it's really nice to be up here, but I'm also really just proud of everybody. And for those, I mean, again, first time projects and you get to get nominated for an Emmy is incredible. You know, you we talked about how you're relatively fresh at this and suddenly this incredible thing has happened. And, you know, Jen Malone was sort of in awe of, you know, the, the, the sudden rush of success. And when you work as hard as we do and you work with so few rewards, to be able to have these small perks goes a great distance and it gives you enough motivation just to keep on pushing through and to keep on contributing. Does um, anyone want to jump in and maybe talk more about the personal impact also, about the, 
nomination means for you, for your career, and... Uh, yeah, I mean, I think Tom has said it really well. I think it's really exciting for people to recognize what music supervisors do and see a little bit more of the full spectrum of what we can bring to a project. I think that's, for me, one of the most exciting things about this is um, a lot of people just really being able to recognize that and see just, you know, how much music can add. I think they know that inherently, but I think to be able to see the faces of the people that actually are behind the scenes is really nice. It's nice to be celebrated and acknowledged for the work you do, obviously. You know, but I think what she, uh, Brianne just touched on is really interesting, and this might have been part of why Thomas, why, why, the, why there was such a fight to get us recognized in the first place, is no two jobs are the same. And if you know, I look at all five of us here, and each one of these projects is very different from the other. And I think this is a really unique and interesting gathering of uh, programs and uh, different specialties on Showcase. And it's, it's really kind of exciting to, to be able to put that forth to the community to show the, the, the myriad of things that we bring to the table. How was your collaboration with uh, music director and also composer Alec Lacamoire? And uh, what creative conversations did you have early on when you came on board for Foster Verdon? Well, I mean, I just want to say, you know, first off, thanks to the Guild for, you know, for getting us this uh, category in the first place. And, um, and it's such an honor to be part of all this with, with everybody here. And, uh, and Fosse Vernon, I just, you know, being part of this show is, a, is in itself the award. And collaborating with someone like Alex is just a dream. I mean, you know, these are, you know, Alex Lackamore, Tommy Kale, Steve Levinson, uh, Lynn Manuel Miranda. You know, these are people at the top of their game. And, and I just sort of would look around the room and wonder who let me in here, you know? And, Working with Alex, we were just, we were a partnership, and you know we just sort of looked at the road ahead of us, and and it's it's daunting. And these are two very important stories in the entertainment business, and we needed to get it right. So our first conversation revolved around accuracy, uh, historical accuracy in the arrangements and in the vocals and the production and the staging. So we, you know, we dug back into various archives to find the original orchestrations for these pieces that we were reproducing. Um, and then we had this really amazing orchestrator named Larry Blank who knew Fosse and knows where all the bones are buried to the point where we would pull out orchestrations and Larry would point at one and say, well, you know, it says that it's this, but in reality it was that. And, um, and it's sometimes we would discover maybe that a player had played a wrong note and we replicated the wrong note because we wanted to be accurate. So that was the first step that we took on the journey. And just collaborating him with him every step of the way was just a dream. You didn't only use uh, source music that was musicals, which was the majority, I think, in every episode, but you also used source music that uh, was non-musical, right? Yeah, I, but it, all the source music... Um, much of it came from uh, Bob's repertoire, from some of his shows that we didn't represent. Like he did some jukebox musicals, and they weren't calling them that back in the day, but they were sort of dance musicals. So we pulled some of the material from that. Um, Nicole Fossey, Bob and Gwen's daughter, was our one of our executive producers, and she was around on set. So when I, a new script would land that said that she would maybe be listening to a record in her bedroom, I could just turn to her and say, oh, so what sort of stuff would you listen to? Um, so what a great resource that was. And then, you know, I think none of us here can deny the, the value that the various publishers and labels bring to the table, because when we're fishing around for that one elusive slot, it's great to have collaborators out there in the world that we can reach out to and say, hey, it's 1955 and I'm looking for this and, you know, can you help me? Um, because it's a collaborative business that we're in. And do you think it was uh, fairly easy to get the, the to get the rights cleared for, the, especially for the musicals, or was that a challenge? You thought. You know, I worked with Ryden Griffiths over at Fox, who many of you know, um, to work on the grand rights, to, to restage the shows. Um, and you know, most of these uh, publishers were very eager to have their music exposed to a new audience because a lot of these have been lost to time. People don't think of Dan Yankees very much, whereas they might Cabaret. So people were really eager to, to be part of this. Pippin was a struggle. And that maybe a struggle is the wrong word. It was a challenge because uh, Stephen Schwartz, uh, we, we all know him one way or another. 
and the entire that Pippin episode, episode four, which is it's wall to wall Pippin music. Every piece of music in the show in that episode comes from Pippin. So that was just a very complicated process because every time a use changes, you have to go back to Mr. Schwartz for approval, and that just took quite a long time. But you know, we we climbed the mountain, and you got the approval finally. <laughs> yes, finally. <laughs> Sometimes last minute. Jasper, how was that for you working on Quincy and uh, the film being co-directed by Quincy Jones' uh, daughter? Do you think that was an advantage actually to get music cleared? Was it easier or did yeah, it make I'd say so. Yeah, I can safely say it was easier. Um, just because oh, I, I personally didn't actually um, go about getting the clearances. I worked closely with an amazing powerhouse of a woman called Nancy Stern and Nancy Nancy helped push all of those sort of deals through. So uh, we worked really closely together. I prepped her as much as I possibly could. Um, but she had a lot of the relationships in place um, to make it happen. Um, but ultimately, um, I think that people just understanding that the project was tied to Quincy. Um, I think there are a lot of people out there who want to make Quincy happy. <laughs> so I think in that way, it was a tremendous advantage having him having having him be the subject and um, and and to move a lot of those things over the line. Yeah. When you came on board with, uh, you know, I had talks with the directors, Al, and uh, uh, did you, were you familiar with his work, with Quincy Jones' work and the magnitude of his work or? Uh, so or? Part, part A of the question, I think I was, I was partially across, uh, I'd say like the sort of, the, you know, like the, the fun, like the sort of, what, what, how should I say, like the sort of the touchstone moments in his career were things that I was familiar with. Um, I grew up a jazz obsessed kid in Sydney, Australia, and um, I was really, um, I was really familiar with uh, actually a lot of his earlier big band recordings from the late 50s and early 60s. Um, and then I was across like Frank Sinatra Live at the Sands was an album that I got really into maybe 10, 15 years ago. So I was across that. And then, you know, who doesn't know the work that he did with Michael Jackson? Um, you know, Thrill About, Off the Wall. Obviously, I love those records too. Um, but I, what I wasn't across at all was the magnitude of, of his work and the, and the scope of his catalogue and the variety of his catalogue. Um, I had no idea that he had sort of had five careers you know I think that um I think that I would be so happy to have had one of his careers you know just the career he had as a jazz trumpeter was incredible um the career that he had as a tv and film composer was amazing um obviously as a pop producer and everything else so that was something that I wasn't um for, but that was something that was new to me um and just how prolific he was was also uh was was also well, I guess I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it came as a surprise, but it was certainly daunting um, when basically on my first day on the job, I was handed a hard drive of 3,000 songs. It was like, <laughs> get to work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This being your first project, uh, beside, you know, obviously listening to 3,000 songs and doing all the research, were you aware of all the other part of the business, the paperwork, the di timelines, the negotiations, the staying on schedule, all the paperwork and all that? And what do you think about that now? <laughs> um, no, the paperwork was quite new for me, actually. Uh, I grew up touring in bands and um, songwriting and producing. And so, uh, no, that, that whole side of things was quite new to me. But I think I was, I mean, the truth is I was really, I was, incredibly honored to take the job on in the first place. It was something I was really, really excited about. Um, but I've, I was really nervous as well. And um, it was really, really important to me that I didn't fail. And I think when I get in that mode, I just do ev everything I possibly can to, um, you know, to increase my chances of, of success. So, um, and I understood that being really organized was a part of that. So um, being really organized was, was, a, was a big deal for me and it was just something that I needed to do to get more and more comfortable with the project to begin with. So you think you want to do more music supervision, more, more composing, more band again, or is it going to be a mix of everything? Uh, um, the, the honest truth is, uh, the, the honest answer is I'd, I'd love to do a mix. Yeah, I'd love to do more supervision. Um, this, this project in particular was just so, it was so rewarding. And, um, and yeah, just to, to echo what was said before, I mean, it, the just 
getting the job in the first place and being a part of this project was the biggest award. So everything after that point is I'm just sort of seeing as such a bonus that, you know, this included. And by the way, thank you so much for having me. Um, but yeah, so, um, but to answer your question, um, I, I, I do enjoy working in different capacities in music and I feel like that sort of, uh, it keeps everything fresh for me. Um, but if there was another project that came along and it spanned, you know, a year or two or more or something, I'd, I'd very, very happily do more supervision. Um, but I'm also working, uh, doing some co-composing at the moment on Al's next project, so which is, you know, challenging in different ways and exciting in different ways too. So we so, might see your DM is in a different capacity. Oh, I'd year. love that. Yeah, <laughs> bring it on. <laughs> Let's talk about Gotta, uh, gotta Get Up. Um, Brian, how, how difficult was it? I mean, first of all, was that from the beginning, did the, did the showrunners want that song in there? Or so was that... that song, yes. So it was written into the script. Um, and initially when I met with the creators, it was something that they said, we think we want this. We are open to exploring other options. And we explored a lot of other options. But it was it, it certainly kept going back around. So it was um, it was just the perfect fit. And then you had different versions, or was it just for versions of the song itself? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or um, no, I mean we had the 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 Harry Nelson version that's sort that of was always on Nelson mm -hmm. Nelson. Yeah, it was it's sort of the most well known of of that song. Yes. And how difficult was that to get licensed, especially? I mean, did you know that it's going to be used all over and over and over again? It, or? it was it was a very delicate negotiation because we didn't know exactly how many times we were going to use it. We didn't know exactly how many times the main character was going to die and come back and it was going to be used. So I think that it became a very long, drawn-out process of them trusting us, you know, that and us trusting them. Budget was obviously a big concern because we didn't have a big budget. So that was, it was a really delicate back and forth. It was a multi-month process to get that one. Yeah. Uh, when you first read the script to Russian Doll, what mm -hmm. crapped you about the story most, do you think? It, it did such a good job of building this world. I mean, they just, the scripts were so... Detailed. They talked about the artwork on the walls. They talked about what the characters would be reading. They talked about really, really detailed things. So initially, whenever I read a script or a pilot, I like to make a playlist myself. And so that was really fun to go into that meeting and meet with them. And we initially had just like so much to talk about. We were throwing ideas around like rapid fire. So it was really, it was really exciting to think like, what would these characters listen to? And Natasha is such a music person that that was, it was a great back and forth. Do you work in, a, in a, a similar way, Robin? Like, do you, especially on Mrs. Mycel, do you have music that, do you think, what would that character, what would they listen to in that scene? Well, we have, it's 1950s, so I have probably a playlist about, of about 40,000 songs. Um, do I, the, it's not even about the character, it's about the show. I know what Amy and Dan like. They know what they want. Um, it's a collaboration. It's a crazy hard show and fantastic to do. Um, I love that music. Um, I, I love the music of the 50s and went to camp. So the Catskills episode mm -hmm. was like for me a dream. It was my life of my parents and my grandparents and growing up. And You grew up in New York. I right? grew up in New York, a Jewish New Yorker. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, so when, when I read the script, I was just flying. I was like, oh, my God, we have this music, and we have this, we could do, use this. And we had bands, and we had to cast singers, and we had to cast different bands, and we had a, had, oh, there was so much going on in that episode. It was insane, and flew to New York. And ironically, we were on the set of the Catskills episode when they announced the Emmys for last year. So I was sitting there, and I was like, we found out we had all these nominations, and here we are again, which is awesome. This is it's, awesome. It's, it's pretty great. Such a wonderful show. I read in an interview that uh, early on when you, you would read a book and then hear music for several scenes in your head and then you would watch the movie and it didn't line up what they used. And that's it's kind horrible. of... Uh, but uh, and then that's kind of how you got into music supervision. Uh, is that right? Yes, and it, is it still is right. nowadays that you... You read a script, you read a book, and you kind of l hear music already? I do. Is well, that... usually I was I would be reading a book listening to music. So when I would see the movie or the, and the music wasn't in there, I was it would, 
it jarred me. I was like, wait, that's not the right music. So that that was really something very, I didn't realize that till later on. Now I, I actually am better when I see a scene than reading a script. Because now that I'm actually putting music in, I'm... If I don't like Maisel is different because I know I know the show, but but if I don't know the show, I usually find it easier to watch it and then say, okay, this is what's going to work, because you can read a script and a director can direct it completely differently than what you're imagining. So I don't know if that answers your question. No, totally, yeah. Okay. And are you how involved were you in the? Uh, there's so many live performances. Are you involved in oh the audition God. process yeah. there? Or you should you should see season three. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's insane. Yeah. I was, and you're involved in that yeah, also. Yeah, in yeah. We were in, Do you yeah. love that? Or? I love it. I love it. I don't go every time, but when there's like we had these, the Catskills. I was there for all the Catskill stuff and all the other, most of the on camera. And then we have a music producer that's there, and we've got my co-producer Matt Shapiro, who's I couldn't do without, and we've got a great music editor who you use, Annette. <laughs> She's amazing. She's like the best person ever. Um, but it's 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 a show of a team of amazingly fantastic people that you can't put a penny down without it being noticed. And we're all a team. It's like everybody works with each other. You know, we we're shooting something. On Monday, we still don't have the song. So I email Amy today and I said, could you pick one? I'll let you know when I do. Okay. Sunday night? It's, well, yes, maybe <laughs> Sunday night. You know, it's, 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 it's intense. But they're writing, they're creating, they're producing, they're thinking about music, they're thinking about costume. You know, it's everything. So we're only doing eight episodes in season three, though. But it's, the whole but process, huge episodes. It sounds like so much fun to work on it's that show, so and I think fun. it shows on the on on screen. You see that how much everybody, fun the cast has. Everybody, the cast, the crew, everybody. It's a big family. They're just they take care of you. And we, when we had the fires last year, and everyone said, "Did you grab your Emmy?" I went, "No." I mean, that was the first question everybody asked me. Did you grab your Emmy? I was like, if they don't give me another one, <laughs> there's something wrong with the Academy. No. But, but I mean, they literally, like, they flew me in for the premiere. They're like, you have no place to live right now. Go stay. Go, come to the premiere. I'm like, I can't come. I, I'm, I'm, I'm in the middle of this. They said, what, what? You know, so everybody is incredibly supportive. And I've never worked with a better crew in my life. That seems Seriously. like family. It is a family. And, and, it's, and it's tough. And every, every single person in every single department does more than I've ever seen anybody do in, in anything. Thomas, um, something stupid. Uh, so a lot of uh, your Emmy-nominated episode, a lot of viewers I, uh, online say it's the best opening ever for Better Call Saul, best intro. I think it's one of the saddest also. It's very emotional. How, what is the story behind that? about uh, picking that song and doing that scene? Um, well, you know, with Better Call Saul, you know, the show is in many ways the evolution of a character from one version, Jimmy McGill, turning into Saul Goodman. And for those who watched Breaking Bad, we know that we're going to be arriving at a certain point. So we knew that there was an end point. So in many ways, I think one of the, the, the genius choices that, that Vince and Peter, Vince Gilligan and Peter Gould did was, recognizing that in a sense we're telling a tragedy, but in a comedic format. And I think because of that, we are really dancing between the comedic moments and the tragic moments, recognizing of where the trajectory of the character goes. You know, when we meet Saul Goodman, he's somebody who doesn't think twice about suggesting that someone should just get killed in prison to kind of get rid of a problem. In order to get to that person, we have to see what the road was for them to evolve. And I think that when we first began to recognize the characters and get to know them, we saw that a lot of the storytelling was the anchors that kept Jimmy McGill towards some level of authenticity, towards honesty, towards integrity. And one of them was the pressure that his older brother had, Chuck. And so in many ways, we were crafting out the arc of how Jimmy handles the influence of his brother, the disappointment of his brother, the impossibility of impressing his brother. So it's really a very micro approach to an individual character and how their evolution of heartbreak changes them as a person to lead them to that version that we get to know in Breaking Bad. Um, and so with something stupid, we used uh, the opportunity to tell the story of another major pillar in, Saul, in, in Jimmy McGill's evolution, which is that um, 
Kim Wexler, the, the love of his life, is someone who he wants constantly to be worthy of. And that the drive to be worthy of someone is a very powerful drive in some characters. And for him, it's incredibly important that he never fully arrives at a sense of feeling worthy. He flitters between feeling unworthy and feeling moments of just joy at the fact that she's still part of his life. So we had this wonderful opportunity to tell the story of their drifting apart as two different people. And when we first saw, you know, the, the written out piece, and the scripts are so beautiful in Better Call Saul. They're among the best scripts I've ever read. And, and I read a lot of scripts, even other people's work. I just love reading great writing. And we knew it was a split screen. We knew that we were telling Jimmy's story and Kim's story in context. We knew that they were living together but drifting apart. And so it was an opportunity of when is there an overlap of those two worlds and when are they two separate people? So we had to find a song that was going to somehow move this entire story forward. And we tried many different ideas. Um, one of the ideas that we came across was the Frank Sinatra, Nancy Sinatra version of Something Stupid. And in addition to the really creepy component of a song by a father and daughter singing about a romantic song, which has never stopped being creepy, um, <laughs> there is something very interesting about the upbeat nature and the downbeat nature of it and the way the lyrics work, and we couldn't quite shake it off. So we tried a lot of different ideas out. Some of them were really good ideas, some of them were really bad ideas. That's part of our process. But we couldn't quite shake it off. But we had a very simple problem. The song was two minutes and 30 seconds long. It was a Frank Sinatra song that meant that the cost was going to be prohibitive. We do not have a big budget on the show. Uh, we knew that there was an AFM recording that meant that we had union players on it, which meant that the AFM fees were going to be absolutely prohibitive when they came back. So, and it was too short. We knew the sequence was almost six minutes long, and we were really trying to tell a very ambitious story. So we realized there was no way we could extend the song. We couldn't afford it. There was no way of making it work, but we couldn't shake off that this song felt right. So we went through with about two weeks window of time, an incredibly rushed process where we reached out to a number of wonderful licensing reps, and I'm sure many of you here in the audience tonight, and basically said, we need covers of this song. And we need them in this tempo because the editors were cutting the sequence to this. We need it at this length. Please deliver us some interesting ideas. And we got an absolutely amazing number of pieces. And we went through them all. And I want to say it was close to 80. Garrett's in the audience. He probably can identify how many. It was a lot. And we went through all of them. And it was a mixture of heartbreaking and horrifying and beautiful and tragic. And there were two that we really responded to. One of them was an upbeat version, but it was done in a really interesting way. It was a duet, so we knew we had, needed to have a female and a male vocal. Mm -hmm. And the other version was a completely counterintuitive version. It was very downbeat, very sad, almost tragic. And we couldn't shake that one off either. So we suddenly realized maybe we need to start with that. And Peter and Vince had the really, I think, insightful understanding is that by using the sad version, we are showing the end of the sequence in the beginning and that we need to have the audience have that evolution with the characters as we slowly recognize that these two people that we're tremendously invested in, emotionally attached to, we want them to stay together and it's just not working. So we ended up going with the version by a, an artist named Lola Marsh who was a duo. Israel, right? Yep, out of Israel. And we had the most incredible next few days. So we picked it in a week. And then the next four days was basically, you know, being up all night on Skype after they finished their live shows in Israel, walking through detailed notes, every single moment of the song we focused on, instrumentation, subtle shifts, uh, timing, everything imaginable. Then they would send me another version. I'd wake up in the morning, I would send more notes. We went back and forth on this. And in the end, we ended up with this really, I think, beautiful and heartbreaking and very uh, original piece. And of course, the editors were at the same time cutting to the same tempo. So we knew that we had to match the tempo and the song kind of locked in. So it was very much a mix of strategy, um, resourcefulness, and then being able to really produce this track on Skype while the artists were in Israel kind of sending stuff back. And they did an absolutely beautiful job. And so on that mixing stage, literally breathless, running in with like, you know, the, the final digital files, 
we looked at it and we just thought like, oh my God, that's great. And then there was another component, which is all of the mixers who were so talented, found a way to split out the vocals and the instrumentation. So we were really reflecting the two worlds in the screen and the split screen. So everybody contributed. Again, you mentioned this earlier, it's such a collaborative job. And the, the real joy of it is that everybody adds, everybody adds. And so, you know, I'm up here right now, but the truth is I'm up here for my entire team. I'm up here for Lola Marsh. I'm up here for all the licensing people that sent demos over. It's like, we all do this together. And that's kind of the joy of it. And it worked beautiful. It's really, it's a heartbreaking little sequence. Thank you. And I would urge, you know, watch all the nominated uh, episodes if you can, or at least listen to the music, especially if you're a voter. You know, listen to everything. It's all the projects are really, really, they are diverse and they're amazing projects. I always forget Stephen. We're all very lucky. I forget. Uh, are we doing audience uh, questions also? Uh, I think we should. Then, can we? Okay. And, you know, let me throw one other thing too. Like, I'm such a fan of all the projects here. Like, I mentioned this to Jasper earlier. Like, watching Quincy was one of my favorite experiences of the year. Like, I, my heart was in my chest the whole time because when I was a kid, we didn't have documentaries about Quincy Jones. You know, certainly not with the length and detail of that. And to watch it being made so beautifully and so powerfully. And I remember, like, literally, I binged all of Russian Doll in one. <laughs> One night, you know, and it's like, I think my girlfriend woke up in the morning. And she's like, are you still? I'm like, yeah, I know. But it's like really, really good, you know, and, and you know, Maisel just watching the evolution of it. It's one of the most joyous thing. And, you know, God, Stephen, I just want to say like, all right, all that jazz is one of the greatest moments of all time. Bob Fosse is one of the gods of all time. And you got to be in the middle of that. God damn. Um, this is where I'm so, pinch, pinching myself. I know. We're so lucky. We're so yeah, we lucky. lucky. How is it going with Into the Heights in New York at the moment? Really well. We just wrapped photography late at night, uh, well, I guess early Saturday morning, and we've now launched into editorial. It was just, uh, I, I came out here to do Fosse and basically just stayed. And um, it's just, it's been a dream project. I can't wait for everybody to see it next year. Well, but we look forward to having you back here at the Emmys. All summer, sitting on street corners and shooting on location in the rain and fires and floods and thunderstorms and blackouts has been pretty exciting and exhausting. Super. That's why I'm drinking tea. We have champagne here on stage. Oh, I wish I had what? that. What? <laughs> <laughs> Jasper, how, working on Quincy, uh, not having an underscore, uh, do you think that was an, a disadvantage? And how did you go about kind of moving this story with the source music only without having an emotional help, so to say. Right. Um, I love the idea from the beginning. I was actually, I was telling Thomas before that I was really hoping Alan Rashida would go, would sort of take that road. Um, so I was really excited when Al called me and said, you know, I think, I don't think we want any original score in this. I think we really want to uh, only draw on music from Quincy's pre-existing pre catalogue. Um, so... I don't know. I think I don't think I saw it as a as an added challenge in any way because it was an idea that I, I really believed in from the beginning. I thought, well, if this movie if this movie is about Quincy Jones, um, what better way to complete the picture of who Quincy Jones is as a person than to heavily draw on his catalog of music because it's obviously you know probably the biggest most significant part of his life. Um, so no, I love the idea, um, but it definitely came with some challenges. Um, for those who have seen the do for those who haven't seen the documentary, sorry, um, it sort of bounces back and forth between the decades a lot. It bounces back and forth between um, current day Quincy, sort of this like fly on the wall footage of hanging out with him in Switzerland and wherever he kind of bounces, you know, bounces all over the place all the time. Um, but sort of you know, one one minute you're hanging out with Quincy in LA and it's 2015, and then you're in New York and it's the 50s and he's um, you know, rubbing shoulders with Duke Ellington and Louis Armstrong and, and um, oh, God, the list goes on. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but then, you know, we're back in the current day and then we're back in the 60s. And, and so uh, one of the challenges was to achieve a sense of cohesion between the music. And so sometimes, you know, I, I guess sometimes the first consideration was finding uh, the selection that really f seemed to fit the, fit the song, sorry, fit the scene the best. Um, but then I also played, paid a lot of consideration to, um, I guess a better way of saying it is I sort of tried to think like a composer would um, and sort of would pay attention to things like 
um, uh, arrangement and tone color and texture and these sorts of things and sort of would try and theme and motif and, and to sort of establish a, a sense of cohesion through the, through the documentary, yeah. And you uh, obviously have been working with uh, Dave Porter for Breaking Bad already now on Better Call Saul. Steve, you had uh, you know you worked with Alex and Nathan on, on uh, you worked with him on um, uh, Fosse. Uh, how is that collaboration? How much um, impact do you have on the, you know on the on the underscore? And do you how how, the, how is your collaboration with the composer, Stephen? Yeah, um, you know, I'm fortunate to have worked with some really great composers, and working on the score is one of my favorite parts of the job, actually. So I'm usually, you know, in this case of Fosse as well, just you know, involved from starting with spotting, uh, work with the composer, either Alex or Nate. Uh, you know, they send me all their demos, you know, for my ears first, so we can talk about each moment, and. Um, it's just, it's, it's one of the, especially with Alex, it was one of the more collaborative areas of our uh, working together because he was new to Underscore and he's new to film and television in general. Uh, you know, he's got a, you know, an, an apartment full of Tonys, but this is a new world for him. And I was just really honored that he sort of looked to me to sort of to help him along the way, but he was just really, really phenomenal. And it was with the show like Fosse Verdon, the challenge is to create an underscore that serves the story and serves the time and place, but doesn't doesn't feel dated, doesn't feel um, sort of too antique, but that yet doesn't feel too contemporary or droney. And we and there was sort of an ongoing sort of tug of war in um, in terms of arrangement and orchestration, and we just kept thinning things out um, as we went along because the bigger we went, the more out of place it felt for the show and uh, the songs. Each, each episode has a, uh, you know, a handful of on-camera musical numbers. So, you know, in a 45-minute show, we've already got quite a few minutes of big music. So simpler was better. So it ended up being a lot of clarinet and piano. And um, God, we just had some of the best musicians in New York working with us. And, um, you know, Robin mentioned Annette, who, you know, one should never underestimate the genius and support of a music editor, especially one as great as Annette. Um, she's all, you know, she is responsible for the, the musical constructions of these episodes just as much as the rest of us. And for you, uh, your work with Dave, and how has that also evolved over the years, you would think? Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the things I love the most about music supervision is the, the sort of holistic curatorial approach to it in the sense that you're bringing all the elements to the table. Um, and to me, the hiring of the composer is one of the absolutely key components. And, and we tend to be very active in the hiring of composers on our projects. Uh, we're frequently bringing different people to the table. We're sometimes asking for demos. We're, we're doing, we do a lot of research. And some of that is really just getting to know the composers personally and getting a sense of what their personalities are like. Are they going to work well with a, a showrunner that wants to show up you know, on a Saturday and hang out all evening watching them plink on a keyboard? Or is it somebody who is going to be able to like take notes on a quick turnaround time even when they're contradictory you know and and each composer has a different approach uh we had worked with dave on um of all things las vegas which was a god-awful show that i worked on for a short <laughs> period of time um and on that show uh dave had helped us out with some live musical performances we did and what really impressed me with dave was as i listened to more of his score he was one of those guys that was really way more talented than I think the projects that he was getting. And I think that one of the things that we all do professionally is we hear talent through the morass of opportunity. And sometimes opportunities are limited and they have to do with timing, they have to do with opportunity, they have to do with a lot of factors. And if we're able to hear through that, we can see when the timing is right for somebody to really step in. So when we were working on the pilot of Breaking Bad, Dave was one of the people I reached out because I did not see a lot of score in Breaking Bad in the pilot. And it had been wall to wall in the pilot that I looked at. Mm -hmm. So when they hired me, the first thing I said is, I want to get rid of almost all your music. And they, I don't know why they hired me, but it was maybe because I was just the one honest person that just said, I, I love everything about your show and I really, really hate the music. I think that you're doing a disservice to it almost at every turn. 
And I would just start from scratch. I would literally throw everything out and start from scratch. And they said, okay, big shot. Let's show, see what you did. Dave was the one person that I think recognized uh, the subtlety, the nuance, the avant-garde quality of it, um, the sense of uh, a rigidity and a powerfulness of purpose that uh, is really special to his work. And watching him evolve from the sound of Breaking Bad and into Better Call Saul, which is totally different, um, is really exciting. And I think that in many ways we get a chance to be like, you know, in a way, we, we usher artists along, we work with them. We, uh, you know, Dave does not need my notes on things. He and Vince and Peter work really well together. So I don't interfere on that part. But in our spotting sessions, we're super active and that's where we really talk. And we really talk about how we want the music to work, the nuance of it, when we wanna come in, what we wanna underline. And because Peter and Vince are so interested in story and those, those, those episodes are all really about characters and story, it means that it's a very uh, important conversation. Like our music spots for a one hour show go between five and six hours. And we have all of our sound design and we have all of our uh, dialogue effects there and everyone's in the room. And we're talking about the holistic plan for every episode. They go on forever. But the truth is, they are so exciting because a lot of the best ideas happen in that room. And they happen because Dave will see an opportunity for something and he'll voice it. Or I will see something and then we kind of figure out together if it works. And that level of confidence and comfort level and the ability to have a bad idea and voice it verbally is... And a lot of trust, I think. A lot also. of trust. Yeah. And we know that when we get it back, it's going to be really extraordinary. And you know, there's definitely times when Dave will have a hard time on an episode and we'll say, should we try another approach to this? Like, should we try to source this or should we try another? And, and sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. We're always looking out for each other and we're always helping each other out. On other projects, we do a lot of score notes. So it depends really on the project. Mm -hmm. with, with, with Dave, we don't so much because the communication is so good. Our job really is to know how can we help. And as long as we're able to be conscious of how can we help, how can we best add value to the project, then we're doing our job right. And that changes on each project. Before we open up, I have one question to everyone. Uh, I, if a music supervisor in the room wants to submit an Emmy episode next year, how did you pick your episode? How do you, is it the most music? Is it the most emotional impact? How, what tip could you give? How do you find the episode you want to submit? I picked the Catskills. Um, I was told Amy and Dan want me to pick the episode. And I picked it because it was the first episode of the season that I think people gravitated towards and loved, and it was so musical and so much work, and I just think that the music in that episode is so, so Catskill, <laughs> you know? It just, it just had its way of, of people talked about it, people tweeted about it, people emailed me about it, people like, oh my God, going to the Catskills. The thing is that episode... Three, uh, 204 and 206 were both the cat skills, and I wanted to put them both up, but we weren't allowed. And then we also had episodes that I was I was kind of going back and forth because some our character was singing a song, and then we had this whole dance number with pink shoelaces that became huge. And I thought, well, maybe I should put that. And I was like, no, the cat skills was where I think it grabbed most of the audience for season two, and that's why that one went up. And I had the most fun with it. <laughs> Yeah, I went with story. Like I felt that um, something stupid was one where not only did we have a song that was extraordinarily difficult to put together under a tight time frame, and I think worked really well, uh, but also there were other moments in the episode that were really key. We had a whole sequence where we have the, um, you know, the, the German uh, miners coming in and 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 going into a, into basically Gus's underground meth lab, and you know there was a beautiful use of of a Burl Ives song that was in there, and it just felt like. Nobody else would do this. This just feels like us, you know? It's like, it's like, it's, and this is what I love about my team. Like, we work together, and a lot of the best ideas come out of the blue, and I'm like, oh my God, I never would have thought of that. That's actually beautiful. And then you throw it forward, and you hope that, you know, one of those ideas will happen. And you never know where it comes from. It could come from Garrett, it could come from Yvette, it could come from Michelle. And that's the exciting part of it. I feel like we are very democratic in our approach to story and our attempt to find the right answer. And to me, we had so many story points on that episode, so many moments that were really key, and music was a big contributor to story. And we recognize we're not a musical. You know, we're not a showy show in mm -hmm. a sense. We're, we're very low key, and we're in many ways underplay most things. So I just think that the, the integrity of the storytelling was to me what was most important, and that's really reflective of the show as a whole. Steven, 
so, you know, mine was very much the opposite of Thomas's. We are, are a very showy show. And I chose this one because this is, you know, this series kind of shooting out of a cannon. Um, it, it starts big with Big Spender and doesn't let up musically. And it's a great introduction to just not, not only the, uh, our musical uh, palette, but also the characters it, uh, as an episode of Functions Well on its own. And it just, I, I wanted to present this one as my uh, submission because it also, it, 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 tick, it, it, it covers all the bases of all the things that, that you know, we bring to the table musically on the show from you know, on-camera musical numbers to live vocals recorded on set. It's where we established Alex's underscore themes, a lot of source cues um, and just some complicated staging of musical numbers. And it just, it's just such a, a satisfying piece. And also the film Cabaret, which is what we're showing in this uh, episode, is a personal favorite of mine. And I think that, that the film Cabaret is maybe one of the reasons I'm in this business in the first place, because it really affected me on you know, late night cable television as a kid. And I don't think I was supposed to be watching it, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> I think for Russian Doll, and I think the advice that I would give is to choose the episode that feels most supremely like that world that you've created the, the soundtrack for. So with Russian Doll, it was, it ha I actually liked a lot of the music that we used in the second episode more, and I struggled with that as well. I, I thought, ah, oh, that would be such a great one because I love so much of so many of those songs. But the first one, it almost felt like if you took the music out of it and you listened to it, it would give you that tumultuous sort of mixed up, timeless, because in Russian Doll, like one of our big themes and one of our themes with the music was really the suspension of time because she's dying. You're not really sure what era, you know, like what's happening. So there is a suspension of time. And I think a lot of the music, you know, we had a couple of artists, um, like this woman, Kat Edmondson, and she's a new artist, but she sounds like she's from the forties. So it's like this great sort of, you just really wanted to feel like that universe. And I think that was what it was for me is just how can we, if you take the music out of the episode, would you feel like you're in that universe? And I think for you it was easy. It's relatively <laughs> straightforward. <laughs> <laughs> is there some audience questions? Have you, any of you seen that, uh, that uh, issue where they're trying to keep music supervisors doing the songs and composers in their lane and the showrunner kind of wants to run that? We don't have a composer. Yeah, and I would say only with like I think business affairs, things like that, you know, a lot of times, but like nobody else does. Like when you're in the trenches, you're all like in it together, but you find that when there's business affairs components, like I, I no offense to anybody who's in business affairs, but I feel like they seem to know the least about what we do. And so I think that's the only time I personally come across that that siloing process. Yeah, I think it's a shame if that, you know, that if that's the case. I think it's really nice to be able because you want the music and the score to feel really cohesive. You want those two pieces to work really beautifully together. So I think that would be such a shame for, you know, people to try to keep them separate. I think it's up to us to tell the showrunners it's not the right way to do the job. And yeah. yeah, it's a collaboration, it's, it's, you know. <laughs> you know, we have to say to them why it's not the right way to do it because it doesn't work that way. It's it's one cohesive project. And, and especially in the case of when, when you're bringing the composer on board, it's a little bit like you break it, you buy it. You know, if you bring in a composer that doesn't work out, you got to carry that water all the way up the hill. So it's really important to choose the right people. And if the showrunner has somebody on board already, it's really your job to figure out how do they work and how do I learn how to dance with this group. And I think that that's what we, I think, do pretty well is figuring out how to work with an existing group and then still contribute. Um, but uh, I haven't I, I haven't had that much of that. But I, I, I guess it, it, maybe it's a it's a factor on other projects. Hi, my question. Hi, thank you all for coming, and I love all your shows. It's really fantastic all the work that you guys do. I'm kind of curious from beginning to end on when you start a project. Because Steve, you were talking about a lot about the research. Robin, you were talking about forty thousand tracks and how much prep time. Thomas, the detail. Everyone, I'd just like to get an idea of just the amount of time that you've spent on these series from beginning to end. Because it's 10 episodes, so it's just 10 weeks, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> I could answer that. I started Maisel season one, and I've not stopped. I've gone through the year. Because after, after you 
do the research and you do the license and the, do the show because you start in pre-production, production, post-production, and then the licenses still go on. And then with Maisel, it's also, oh, we have this Emmy thing. Can you come up with music for us? Or we have the Golden Globes. Can you do this? And so all of that came into play. And we have this party and we have that. So I'm, I'm helping them with music for all, everything. And then we're already starting season two. So I'm still working on season two as we're on season three. It just doesn't end. Yeah, I mentioned this to Jasper earlier, but like for, for Better Call Saul, we, we meet with the writers before they've broken out the scripts. So we're throwing ideas in from the writers from just opening up. And that runs all the way until the mix of the final episode. And it's I want to say it's like a 14-month window. So it's an insane window of time. And especially there, certain shows have the luxury of being able to, when they're really lucky, write and then direct and produce and then do post. And that is wonderful for those productions. It's horrible for us because the economics of doing a job that runs for 14 months when you're doing a 10 episode fee becomes insane. And you know, as Robin said, we're never in a spot where we can say no. Like they're saying, oh, we have a premiere party. Can you put a mix together? Of course. Um, we have you know, an Emmy campaign. Can you do this? We have a promo coming up. Um, so even in the little bit of downtime that you have between seasons, which is honestly negligible, you're doing stuff all the way through. And we're also trying to kind of like get a fresh breath and dive into the next season. So a lot of that is like, where do we see the story going ahead of time? So there's really never an any end to it. Qu Quincy was a was meant to be a 12 month project, but ended up being about 18 month commitment for me. And started with the research and started with the you know, and then obviously being on hand and working very closely with Alan Rashida, making all the selections. But then my work also entailed a lot of um, I did quite a lot of editing as well. So there was a lot of nipping and tucking going on, and um, to then s sort of make it all work, and then again right through the mix and so it was a really involved process and um yeah but a, but a, but an amazing year and a half you know so i feel very 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 lucky to have had the experience yeah uh russian was about i'd say it was an eight to nine month my heel just went through the floor <laughs> <laughs> um very like varied intensities some really intense periods um the, actually, Natasha would come to L.A. because Post was in New York and I would go to New York. She would come to L.A. and come to my house for, like, the full weekend. Oh, and we would sit on the floor and I would play music and she, we would talk about music and it was very intense. You know, so, like, those pockets where it would get would get very serious. But it sounds um, amazing. Though. Yeah, no, it was great. It was, <laughs> it was a very immersive experience <laughs> for everybody. But, yeah, certainly I think um, it was about, you know, I'd say six months of like really intense production and editing was happening while production was happening and then um, post and then obviously delivering all of all of the paperwork and licenses and, and getting all those checks out and everything, just all of that. Steven, do you want to jump in also? Yeah, mine was, you know, for Fosse Verdon was about just a little under a year. Um, as soon as the first drafts of the first two episodes started to land, I just needed to get on it right away to clear those songs so that they could be you know, ready for uh, for filming uh, a few months later. And then, you know, much like everybody else said, like it just dove, one thing dovetails into the next. And then at the end, there's you know, things that drag on like a soundtrack album or whatever. Um, you never quite know when these projects will end. <laughs> there's always a, a surprise call that comes up when you least expect it. Or when you plan a holiday. Oh, you, well, you can't plan those. <laughs> What, what's that? We also get emails all the time saying, are you still on the show? What do you need? Yeah. So we start collecting music ahead of time as well. Like I know next, this season we're in 1960. Season four, if we have one, is 1961. So I start collecting. Do you I create know also what playlists I want for, the, for the showrunners for inspiration? Or? They don't need inspiration. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we have a very, very interesting way of working on this show, which I'll tell you. <laughs> no. Um, I give them music. I give the editors music. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I give them music. Or Amy says, I need this. Or Dan says, I need this. Or I go here. Do you need, you know, it, it's just, it goes both ways. What were the challenges on, on the shows you're current, you're, you know, on that Emmy nominated show that you've had and how did you overcome those? Robin has a five hour version of this that will be available <laughs> online. Really? Yeah, I have to be coming out to read it all. Challenges time, getting answers, and reading the 
director's mind is there there was a situation there was one song i think it was season 3 but i'm not, i shouldn't be talking about it one song that i got a an email saying hey robin amy and dan are looking for something similar to this not this but they want to find something within the right year because this was like 1970 so first you have 1970 music and 1969 50, 1960 music is completely different so I'm listening and I'm sending, and it was Chinese, and I'm sending songs and I'm sending songs. Nope, not right. Okay. Nope, not right. Okay. Sent clear, I had to pre clear everything because it's impossible to clear Chinese music. Like, what is not right? So finally, I said, here, she said, send me back what we sent. So I sent back what we sent. I said, here's the time code of what I was listening to. And she said, it's just not as fun. What you're sending is just not as fun. And I went, I'm listening to the wrong song. And I was, but I didn't hear oh, that. No. I wasn't told that. I went back to all my things. I found two songs. I sent them. Yep, we love this. It was like, this was a month and a half of literally trying to find one song. So things like that, when people are, because th that has happened. When we were doing season two, I found out, ironically, by talking to a producer, that we have a, a show coming up. In Paris, they're shooting the drag queen scene. Mm -hmm. I said, really, what songs are we using? Oh, I don't know. I said, I don't get paid per episode. I need to get on this, <laughs> season two. So literally two weeks before, we're trying to clear French music. I send Amy all this French music. She's like, oh, I love this. OK, let's use it. I thought it's universal. I thought it's easy to clear. The night before, the, like, couldn't clear it. Couldn't clear it. French music is very different to clear than American music. You have to get rights from every writer. And they couldn't find someone. I said to Amy about two days before the shoot, and she knew we didn't get a clear. I said, Amy, we don't have this cleared. Can I find you an alt? Nope, we're using it. Four o'clock in the morning, the night before the shoot, we got a clear. <laughs> so these are the things that we're dealing with on Maisel, um, and everybody deals with on all different shows. That's the hard part of it, but it's all worth it. It's, it's, it's worth it. I don't know. I don't mind staying up 24 hours. <laughs> Reading people's minds, but they're they're. I love what you do. I love what I do, and it's an incredible show to be part of, and it's it's a lot of work, and it's fun, and it's 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 it shows. It's you know. Yes, sir, Thomas. I'm sure there's been like a lot of murmurings, and due to a very aggressive Twitter campaign from Aaron Paul and uh, uh, the rest of the Breaking Bad crew, uh, there's been circulations of rumors about the Breaking Bad movie. I'm sure you've been very fo focused on Better Call Saul right now, but has there been any word about that, or? I have no idea what you're talking about. I've, I've heard so many rumors about a Breaking Bad movie. I don't own Twitter. <laughs> I... there, there, is a, there is a super aggressive Twitter campaign from Brian Cranston Or Or he and, signed a very explicit NDA. That, that too, yes. <laughs> if there were such a thing, I would be honored to be part of it. And in the meantime, I'm going to drink as much tequila as I possibly can. <laughs> I'm sure Brian Cranston and Aaron Paul appreciate it. Luckily, there's a shipment coming to my house very soon. Thank you so much. Is there any more audience questions? Is there a feeling that you receive when you choose music to know that that's the song that you have to, that's, just, that's the song you, you know, like you just know. Oh, yeah. This is the song that's going to be for this movie. This is the song that's going to be for this show. And it's going to work. Is that like a criteria you look for, you hear? A structure? What is that? I mean, absolutely, but I think it's circumstantial depending on the project. Everything's so different. But sometimes I think it's nice when you're not expecting to hear something. I'll be out and about or in a place and I'll hear a song and I'll be like, oh my God, this is perfect for this scene that I could, you know, it was something that you just, it really happens. Um, it happens sort of not when you're expecting it, I think. But I think because every project is so very different, it's impossible to have, you know, that criteria across the boards. One thing I one thing I really struggled with um, on Quincy was not getting too attached to things that did grab me like that. Um, and sometimes I would get pretty. Sometimes I would think I had the thing, and I was like, it has to be this. It has to be this. But then I would always pr present five to ten options to Alan Rashida, and so I sort of got quite good at at slipping it in the deck to where I thought it stood the best chance. Like Wait, if, where's your spot? What's your uh, spot? Well, that's a secret. <laughs> what's your spot? Second? Thomas, what's yours? Oh, third. Uh, Second or third? Uh, <laughs> there's probably more effort put into the sequencing of the options. <laughs> it's so true. As a subtle way of being like, I know they're going to be tired by track four. Right, right. And I'd never, gonna yeah. And five yeah. is going to be the one that yeah. they're going to be like, oh, my God, they got it. And you almost go by, 
What time are they going to receive it? How deep are they in production? Had there been a conversation about editing previously? Or yeah. sometimes it's got to be the last one because they're like, oh, I discovered this one. It was last on the list. That's you know, a, that, was, that was like an thing. afterthought. Oh, Make, making you feel like extra. Mine's, mine's too. Mine's I, but never one. precede it with a dud. That's another, that's another key thing. Always precede it with something that's pretty good where they're like, oh, that could work. But then, then, then you hit them with the, the, the really good thing. Uh, and then they're like, oh, my God, but that's even better. And you're like, uh, <laughs> you, you, you opened up a landmine, a question, by the way. And it's a little bit like DJs because, like, a number of us have DJed. And one of the things about DJing is that it is incredibly important how you sequence things. And everything in the experience is so key. And if you get it right, you know you're going to lift people into a heavenly place. And if you get it wrong, you're going to have an empty room wondering, like, oh, is the bar nearby? Maybe I should go home. Let me see if my lift is here yet, you know? Um, so I think in many ways it's really vital. I think the problem for us to kind of answer your question more directly is that we feel like it's absolutely right and we're so emotionally tied to it because I think we're all very deeply emotional people. And frequently we're doing this alone at 4.30 in the morning. And then we have to say... I got to feel this again two more times right. and then I can stop. Yeah. And so you have to be able to have another moment where you're like, oh my God, that's an angle I never would have thought of. And maybe it's just hitting random play on your iTunes I until you hit something. I found an end title that way. For this movie, Adam, I was, they had a song in there. There's no way it was going to be beat by anybody, by anything. And going through my list and just, I literally just hit something and that was the song. I mean, I didn't know what it was. I didn't know who it was. I, I knew nothing about it, and I heard this. I went, oh, my God, this is a song. And it was a song, which is not really something. We're among the most religious people. It doesn't always work, probably, right? (laughs) (laughs) But it worked. Last question for tonight. Hello. Uh, When getting source music, are you the ones that negotiate the price, or can you negotiate the price? And is that uh, part of your job? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Frequently, it's all of our job. (laughs) And we love the licensors who help us. We couldn't do our jobs without them. Yeah. You know, the labels, the publishers, they're just, yes. And we bitch about the ones that don't. Do we set the budget? No. But we Come have on, to stay Maureen, within that's the a budget. plant. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we set the budget. I want a million dollars. We have to stay within budget. We're kind of like the, the we're like the contractors that come into a house and they say, I want a staircase that moves all the way around and I have $48 for you. <laughs> and then we're like, okay, the wood is going to cost 41 My labor is no longer part of this equation. I got to figure out how much the nails are because the I wood got a guy. I got attacked. a guy who has nails. I like, got a guy. So that's sort of the struggle, but unfortunately. For any aspiring music supervisors, never, ever come in under budget. You're, you're, it's the advice I can give every one of you because your budget will be sh- lower the next season. It happened to me twice. So come in on budget. Don't go in over budget, but don't come in under budget. Doesn't do any, the money doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't make you look better. Just give somebody a little extra. That said, if you go above budget, you won't get hired again. So there you go. It's a thin line. Right. Steven? Um... I came in under budget on Fosse, so I guess I screwed that up. <laughs> do, you, do, you have an, do you have another season? Less money next okay. time. If you have another season, then you have to be. I, I had, I think it was Burn Notice. I had ten thousand an episode, and I came in with nine thousand the first season, and they lowered my budget to nine thousand an episode for the rest of the six years. It's crazy. You should go over and see. It doesn't work, right? It was, it was, it was <laughs> and they, something. Oh, I think it was Brothers and Sisters also. Brothers and sisters, the same thing happened. So I don't do that anymore. Uh, for every episode, yeah. And we had about 18 cues. So if you only take one thing away from tonight, don't, don't go under budget. Don't go under budget. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you for again coming. for the LA Film School, to First Com Music, our sponsors. But most of all, thanks to all the panelists. We'll root for all of you mid-September and good luck at the Emmys.